Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin. I am a huge fan of this band, and so... I talked to Mick about doing a podcast, and he said, that sounds like a great idea. And the next thing you know, he endorsed it. It's endorsed by Uriah Heap. How cool is that? Uh, Pretty amazing. But we have a huge congratulations uh, to give to the band this week. Uh, I had already taped all of the shows last week when I found out about this, but the band hit the milestone of 40 million records sold. 40 million records sold. I, I call them records because I'm older, but uh, whether you whether it be CD, online albums, basically album sales that have been tracked, uh, 40 million. Now, that's not eBay sales. That's not, you know, uh, Discog sales or anything like that. That is actual, you know, bona fide trackable iTunes, Amazon record stores, uh, that sort of thing. Um, absolutely uh, amazing when you think about it and God, what an accomplishment that is. I'm happy if I get my monthly Spotify report and I have like seven people listen to me on Spotify and five of them are are from countries that I don't even know how to pronounce, let alone existed. And, uh, I'm always amazed by that. I'm also amazed by the number of Shazams that I get. But anyway, the, uh, the interesting thing is that when you think about this in terms of the accomplishment of this, like the, the overall accomplishment, yes, 40 million albums sold, absolutely huge. So many people have been touched by the music of this band, as, as obviously all of us, or maybe some of you are just starting to, those of you that have been telling me that you're just getting into the band now. Um, but, you know, it's more than that, because did you just get an album and listen to it once? Did you just get a song and listen to it one time and go, yeah, that's pretty good. Or, oh my God, that's amazing. And never listen to it again. No, you didn't. You've heard a lot of these songs many times over. I see so many people posting in the, in the, the uh, online groups and stuff about, you know, oh, I just love this song. And, and uh, then somebody also chime in with, oh my God, I love that song too. And You've heard it more than once. So it's not even just a matter of the sales. I mean, you that would be so, uh, the multiplier, I don't even know how to think what that would be. I mean, it would be probably in the in, in the hundreds of thousands of, of those millions of people, at least, that have listened to an album a hundred times, I would say. And, you know, obviously this is not a, a factual statistic. I have no idea what those numbers are, but just thinking in terms of you know, people that have repurchased or, or purchased the next album because they like the last album and and that I, I can't even fathom the number of people that that have been reached by that. And then there's all the the people that just go on YouTube and listen and don't actually buy the album. You can't count them as stats because you don't really know what that encompasses. So there, there's so much more than that. But seriously, guys, congratulations. The first posting I saw, I believe, was uh, on Instagram when Russell Gilbrook, the current drummer of the band, had posted a picture of him with his uh, big plaque thing in the mail. And then I saw Paul Newton had posted. He received one from BMG on uh, on Facebook. And uh, and it just went from there. But it was very classy looking, very cool of BMG to, you know, include everybody. I, I thought that was really cool because it seems like these days, so much of the time, it's only the current lineup or only a certain lineup of a band that gets recognized. Um, you know, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has certainly proven that they are very discriminatory of who they allow in a band to get an award. So uh, good on you, BMG. Well done. And, uh, you know, of course, they were uh, the ones that had released the big 50th anniversary, um, you know, package that uh, if you haven't gotten it, it's well worth it. Grab that, guys. A lot of uh, really cool stuff in there. And uh, yeah, just huge coops, guys. Uh, Congratulations. I I could not be happier for you, as well as the 40 million people that bought albums. I know I'm, well, I'm multiple of that, really, because I've I've purchased so many of them. Of course, the deluxe editions now are out of print, so I've had to scavenge a little bit for those. But uh, yeah, I've certainly been part of that statistic over the years as well. And uh, sometimes two or three times per album, because <laughs> that's how it goes. Um, yeah, we got a great show. For we. Who's we? It's me. I'm sitting here alone. 
I have a great show for you guys today. We are going to uh, wind up the actual released tracks on Sweet Freedom today with the song Pilgrim. And then tomorrow we hit the uh, the one bonus track that is not a, uh, you know, like uh, on this one, I have two different versions of Pilgrim. Um, but uh, Sunshine is the only one that I have that uh, was just not released. I believe it was a B-side of something or other. But uh, in any case, it's a, it's a wonderful song, and we're going to get to that tomorrow. Today, we have two per- two versions of Pilgrim. I have to say, though, I, I was a little bit disappointed. You guys know, uh, if you've been listening to this season, that I had not listened to the alternate versions of the song, specifically because I wanted a, uh, a really you know honest and open reaction. And I listened to them before the show as I'm just going through to pick out the differences to see what I want to highlight uh, during the show. And this one's really not that different. It's listed as a previously unreleased extended version, but um, it's it could be one of two things in my eyes. It's either they recorded a longer version and it was edited down to the version that appeared on the album, or, and this is equally as possible, there was the version that came out on the album and then it was recut to be extended because it doesn't sound to me like it was played differently. It sounds like uh, clips were moved around a little bit. And again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not dogging on whoever chose to do that because that is a lot of hard work. Uh, it may have been from a promo uh, perspective. It may have been for, uh, like I said, the way they recorded the song. Could be a lot of things. At the end of the day, here's all that matters. We have the album version. We have an extended version. The extended version sounds very, uh, very cut and paste or... It was the actual recorded version that was then cut down to the version that we've heard on the album. So that's where we stand. Uh, I will be playing a couple of bits of that because there's one part that I'm, you know, I always say it could be because I'm just used to it, but there's one part in there that is a really awkward transition that I want to uh, to play for you guys. And um, yeah, let's hit it because we got a lot to cover today. It's a long song. It's seven minutes and 10 seconds, give or take a couple seconds for blank spots. But uh, yeah, we got a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Here is Pilgrim by Uriah Heep. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Scott, you've gone senile. It's Monday. We don't start the show this way. We start with our gratitude segment of the show. Yes, I know. I'm actually going to switch things up a little bit today, and I'm going to do that at the end. Um, I wanted to get right into the song before I lost my train of thought, which is so easy for me to do. Uh, But speaking of train of thought, so this opening is pretty cool. There's some really nice piano that cuts through because it's in the uh, the upper registers of the piano and, and it just slices through there very nicely. Um, also, we have a, a little bit, uh, you know, the lower midsection of the piano backing it up very gently. We have a wonderful sound that, you know, easily could be somebody that is singing and being processed through, uh, you know, various means, or it could be a synthesizer. I'm honestly not sure. It's pitch perfect, but that doesn't mean anything because this band is always pitch perfect, hitting notes just so perfectly, no matter how uh, varied up and down the scale they are. So I'm really not sure there. We have some really, really solid drums playing here. Just a a great start to this song. We're going to have some great, uh, I don't know what you call this as as a non-guitar player, but it's, um, you know, it's this uh, sort of muted strumming with a wah pedal, very popular in the 70s. Uh, I've always loved that sound. It's the one thing that as a non-guitar player, I really can't create myself. And I think I would, because I think I would use that from time to time. I've always loved when uh, when we hear that in your eye. He, Mick does a, such a great job with that. It's always very smooth and um, speak like smooth, not like my voice is today, but smooth. And uh, yeah, we're off to a good start for this one, I think.
Yeah, see what I mean? I just love that sound. And I love the way that it goes from, you know, muted to not muted for a second and then back to muted again. It just has such a good, um, you know, motion to it. I really like it. I, I always have. That's uh, such a great sound. You know, a lot of times that's accompanied with a little bit of flange. And I like that he didn't use that here. I like that it's just very straightforward and just sounds really good. I also like what the keyboards are doing in the background. Um, you know, bass is bringing it. It's a, a really good start. Now we're going to hear what the vocals are going to do. Well, first of all, of course, nice, strong vocal, again, unlike my voice today, but uh, it really paints a solid picture. You know, you can almost feel that uh, that early morning chill that you would get if you're leaving, uh, you know, while it's still misty, even in, in the summertime, sometimes you can have a chill in the morning, especially depending on where you are in the world. But I, you know, I, I've always felt that, like I always picture this guy in a, in a covered wagon and just kind of uh, starting his journey slow because they just didn't go that fast. And just having to really bundle up because uh, the sun's just coming up. There's mist everywhere. So there's that, you know, a little bit of moist chill in the air. Um, it really paints quite a picture, you know, if you uh, if you allow your mind to relax and just absorb what's going on. Um, bass is, is very uh, wandery. That's not a word, but it is now. Um, really uh, just just uh, very adventurous and wandering. And uh, that really works again in this song as, uh, as that's become such a, a staple in the Uriah Heap sound. But interestingly, now we have the organs pan to the right ear. We have the bass and the guitar in the middle. It's kind of weird. Like it's, a, it's just a weird thing. Like we've, we're so used to hearing now the guitar in the left ear, the bass a little bit more in the middle, the drums in the middle, and then the keyboards on the right. And now everything's kind of middle and right, but yet it doesn't feel that off. There's enough coming into the left ear that, that it doesn't really feel like it's messing with your equilibrium too much. Um, it's okay to hard pan for intros, parts here and there, or an instrument here and there, but you have to have balance in a mix. You know, that it has to be at least reasonable to have a, a certain amount of sound coming in both ears so that you don't feel like you're constantly turning uh, to the left or to the right. And uh, somehow they they pull it off on this one. It's really interesting the uh, the panning on this song. But let's see where it goes next. You know, I have to admit, uh, I, I'm really not that big a fan of the piano sound anymore. I've heard it so much. I've written so many songs on piano. Um, but uh, my friend James Sizemore put out an album. He started to get me to like piano again. And I have to say, right here, this is the instance where I really love piano. It's not the whole song. It's just used as a, as a, an attachment, really, as more of an effect, just those those notes that really cut through right when they need to, but the whole song is not piano based. Now, of course, I do like songs like Rain and, and things like that. But uh, for the most part, uh, I, I've just heard so much piano that I've kind of had my fill of it. And I like to get away from it from from time to time. But uh, this is really nice playing right here, the way it cuts through. I love the sound of this section. It fits so beautifully with the album. Just really, you know, really belongs there. And uh, obviously, we're, we're going to head into another verse. Such a beautiful matter of fact 
Okay, I figured out how this mix is working so well when everything seems to be to the center and to the right. There is a balancing guitar track in the left ear. I didn't quite notice it before, but I heard it more in that verse than uh, than obviously earlier. But it's uh, it's just some nice uh, distortion sound that's coming into that ear, and that is balancing out what the keyboard is doing on the right so that everything isn't making your head lean to the right. Uh, very nicely done. I hadn't noticed that. I knew there had to be a reason why, and that would be it. That's how you balance a mix, ladies and gentlemen. Some great engineering there. Um, but let's talk about that vocal. Great sustained note with a really nicely paced vibrato at the end. I love that. Um, I love what the keyboards are doing behind the vocal. I love the wandering bass, like everything in the song. Another one where I have to say, it just hits on every point for me. Um, just a fantastic song. And I remember... When I when I first got the album, I remember looking at the titles because that's the first thing you do, right? You look at if, see what the back cover has. Are there pictures of the band? Are there titles? What's going on? And I remember thinking Pilgrim just seemed like a really weird thing to write about. But knowing the band as well as I did, even at that point, I'm like, you know what? A lot of times, though, the stuff that they write is a little more abstract doesn't mean it's going to be like about a, a woman churning butter and that sort of thing. But those are the immediate uh, Little House on the Prairie type images that I uh, I got in my head when I first re read the title. Interestingly, I have uh, interviewed Alison Arngram a couple of times who played Nellie Olson on Little House on the Prairie. Very wonderful lady. Absolutely fantastic. Such a sweetheart. Um, if you're interested in those, those are on my other podcast, the Haskin Cast podcast. I only mentioned the, the Pilgrim reference, but uh, yeah, she's really awesome. The, but this song is, uh, it's just got such a, a good power to it. It kind of feels like you're on a mission, you know, with the beat, the way that it is like, I, I have a sense of purpose. I don't need to get there right away. I don't need to rush and get there, but I, I do need to keep up a steady pace to accomplish whatever the thing is. And, uh, and I love that about this song. It feels like it has a sense of purpose. You guys notice that? Did you feel that difference in your head when it went to just the keyboard and everything was kind of over to the right side? Did it kind of make you feel a little bit weird because there was nothing going on in the left ear? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I mean about having a balanced mix. And you can do this for effect. You could do this for, uh, you know, a, a, an ear trick or something. A lot of uh, certain binaural panning, which is done for, uh, you know, working the hemispheres of the brain. Many different scientific theories on that that I'm not going to get into here. But that's all how it's done. It's done with very special panning. Where do you hear a certain sound? How does it go? Uh, does it cross over from one ear to another? Does it stay on one side? What is there to balance that sound? So here now we're finally hearing without the balance. And if they hadn't have put that extra guitar track in there, this is how the song would sound. It would just sound like lopsided and, and you would be just, you know, just kind of not feeling comfortable because something's just not right, even if you don't know what it is. As an audio engineer, of course, I could pick that out and I can say that's why that might that part might have felt weird to you. If it didn't, well, that's OK, too.
just a man. Well, it's not just a man that played that guitar solo, I'll tell you that. That was fantastic. You know, I, I, I'm really wowed by guitar players. There's certain things that I'm a decent enough keyboard player to be able to play. But when I listen to what guitar players can do and I watch him do it, I'm like, but, but there's a string there and you got to jump from this string to that string. It, it really is just so amazing because I can't do it. I, I mean, I probably could do okay if I really sat down and worked on it like so many of you guys do, because I know there's a lot of guitar players that listen to the show. But I really admire you guys for being able to play the, you know, as as well as you do because my brain just it, it just doesn't work with it. Um, I I definitely am a melodic person, but I'm also a percussive person, and that's I think more where my skills lie, uh, other than as a composer. But when I listen to to a solo like this, it just blows me away. And again, it's not out of context. It's not some crazy thing. Yes, there's a lot of notes being played. But as I've said, even when Mick plays fast, it's always within the context of the song. And it and it just feels right. There's a lot of cool effects that he's doing here. Uh, not like effect pedals, but just like the way he's playing. And uh, I really love it. It's always been uh, something that like, I'll listen to it. And I'll be like, I got to hear that again. And I'll go back and listen to it again. And then I'll get to the end of it. And I'm like, I got to hear that again. And I just love that. And then, uh, and then we go right back into a strong vocal. The song's changing a little bit because that never happens with Uriah Heep, right? And uh, let's see where it goes. Just a man in my prime. Love was there, but I had no time. I was cheered and adored. It's interesting, this story uh, right here, when you think about it, because this is probably such a common tale, right? Whatever whatever it is, whether it's war or not, which is the case in this song, or your career, or you know whatever it is that you're so focused on, you only have so much time in a day, and you can only spend that time really doing one thing at a time. Some things you can do two things at a time, but you can only really focus on something major at one time. So if you're uh, all about war, or let's say you're all about, uh, you know, politics or music or whatever it is, it can be really difficult to find a balance in life between that and other things that you care about. And a lot of times those other things that are are not as important as whatever your primary movement is, those things get shuffled to the side. Um, in this case, you know, this woman, she's, you know, she really loves him, obviously, but he's like, yeah, war is more important than you. That's the choice I'm making. And she's losing him to that because, again, you know, it might be that he can't find a balance between war, which would really be 100% dedication, right? Uh, or being, you know, with this woman. It's a tough thing. But I, I imagine this is a story that so many people can relate to, obviously not necessarily war, but just in general. So, uh, yeah, interesting lyric. Very March-like snare drum through that last part. Um, very warlike, you know, something that would be played then. Uh, really cool. Very reminiscent of a, a very familiar part that you hear in a lot of songs from that era. Um, just that that particular beat. But uh, beautiful vocal. Nice music supporting it. Uh, just just really, really cool. And um, it, it's, it's such a sad ending, you know, to the song. But... 
I think it's a very realistic ending. And this is something that I love that we see a lot. Well, we hear a lot more in music than we see in, say, Hollywood. Uh, and not to, to dog on Hollywood, but the fact is, is that most movies and things that we see, they're happy endings. Everything has to be OK. The audience wouldn't accept it if it wasn't. But music, you can you can do whatever you want. You know, you can tell the story however you want to tell it. And I've always loved that about music. It's it's it seems like a much more open palette and and it's much more acceptable to be able to tell a story the way you want to in music than it is, say, in film or television. I don't know why, but that seems to be the way it is, unless that's really not what the public wants. And that's just what we keep getting. I don't know. But I always find it really refreshing when there's a movie that ends on a sad note or something that's more realistic than what we end up seeing in the story. Uh, so I like that this song was uh, a little more tragic. I like it that it's realistic and um, unexpected because, you know, you expect that somehow it's all going to work out. But no, nope, it doesn't. It just sucks for him and it sucks for her. And it probably sucks for the people that he was fighting with. But in any case, uh, you know, his demise is his demise. Great uh, progression at the end. Nice build, you know, when the drums are are uh, doubled up a little bit. I, I haven't really talked about how good the drums sound on this song. The the bass drum really comes through, has a really nice punch to it. I love a punchy bass drum myself. Uh, when I was uh, playing live, I worked really hard to get a good punchy bass drum sound. And uh, I don't know what sizes of drums he played, but um, yeah, I'll have to, to I've tried to look and see what hit the uh, specs on his kit were before and I have not been successful, but maybe someday I'll I'll find out in any case. Um, very cool. I love it. I love the uh, the oscillation of the organ there. Those Leslie's are working overtime, just really bringing out a strong sound there. Really almost sounds like it was pushing it to the limit, like if it would have been any more, it would have distorted too much and, and ruined the song. But it's like right as close to the edge as you can get. Um, love the guitars, especially what they were doing there as the song faded out. God, if only there was extended version of that that we could hear more. Oh, wait, there is. And we're going to get to that. But yeah, great song. I, I love this song. I always have. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing to, you know, to take a concept of, you know, let's let's tell the story of this pilgrim who, you know, he just gets involved in war and. Here's what happens to him. And, you know, it just sounds so light on the page. And then when you start putting music and texture to it, you start turning those words into uh, lyrics and, and the difference between words and lyrics. And, you know, you hear the passion in the vocal. There's there's just so much to it. And then you have like this this nice, adventurous, wandery bass that that uh, just guides the song along. Solid drums, great sounds coming from the guitars and organ. Just it's such a masterpiece of a song for me. And, uh, you know, I don't know how other people feel about this song. I imagine there's some people that love it. I imagine there's other people that are like, it's a throwaway track because no matter what track it is on an album, somebody's going to think that. But for me, it's a very powerful piece of this album and I've always loved it. The only thing that made me sad about this song, and, and this is pretty much what I experience on every album that I love the album on the whole, is that as the, as the song is ending, I know it's the last song on the album. Now, granted, there's a good chance I'm just going to flip it back over to side A if I'm listening to an LP or I'm going to wait for the CD to start over if I'm in the car or if I, you know, maybe I put it on rotate if it's on my iPod, whatever. But 
it's it's just like I want more. It really leaves you wanting more. And for one, I think that's kind of the trick of having a song that fades out, especially if it's the last song on the album. If you're liking what you're hearing, you want more. You're not ready to to let it go yet. And having it fade out instead of just stop, there's no finality to it. So it, it gives you that. But 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 I want to follow that fade out as opposed to a song that just stops and you're like, OK, well, you know, it's over. And it, and it really is a difference of uh, of the way that you feel about the album at the end. So a fade here was was great. I certainly want to chase what's happening in this song more. I want to hear what what Mick does. I want to hear what's happening. And, um, you know, we only get what we get on the album. So I'm going to play you a little bit of the uh, extended version. I'm going to play you the one part that I found or I felt was uh, particularly awkward and see, you know, you guys uh, think what you think of it. But uh, and again, maybe it's just because I'm used to the version that we just heard, but it just seems like a, an awkward transition, much more awkward than it did in the original song. So here is that part right now. Well, of course, it's weird because we're used to hearing it go from that part into, you know, the uh, the the part that is going to serve as the verse again. And here is where it stops instead of where we're used to it. So it's it just seems weird. And just that that note change, while that would be cool if it was done intentionally, um, you know, you can certainly have abrupt changes like that and they're fine. And it's only because we have something else to compare it to that it seems weird. Had this just been the song that we were given on the album, we would be used to this this transition, but it just feels very abrupt and awkward. Um, going by the way the story is, though, that would kind of work. But, um, you know, we're not there yet in the story. We're only up to the part before the guitar solo. So it would be a weird place to put it. But I like I like I like it on its own, but in the context of the song, just because we're expecting that verse to come back in again after that, um, it just it just feels weird to me. And then, of course, there's, as I always say, the fact that we know the version we know and we know it really well. So, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird. And then uh, I'm going to play you a little bit of the end and uh, we'll we'll see what that sounds like. So it's a little bit longer, not huge, just a longer fade. And um, you know, I put that up, I compared the two together and played it. So it's, you know, a few seconds more. There's also a part in the song, I can't remember exactly where it was, but, um, you know, where they do that, uh, that part before it goes into the verse, they, uh, instead of uh, passing twice, it passed four times, which, you know, again, sounded to me like uh, one of the typical radio edits that we would hear, where they would do things like that sometime. And again, you know, probably not even involved involving the band at all, probably either the record company or the engineer or whoever decided to do that. Um, very hard to say because we weren't there. But uh, overall, yeah, it's a really cool song. I really dig it. Great way to end the album. But we're not quite done with Sweet Freedom yet. Of course, tomorrow we have the uh, the bonus track of Sunshine, which is a, a huge favorite of mine. I've always loved that song from the from the first time I heard it when I got the uh, expanded edition of Sweet Freedom, uh, could not stop listening to it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's it's real a real gem to me, like when I got the um, expanded version of Demons and Wizards and first heard the song Home Again to You, just really clicked. Um, I was like, well, I get why that's on the album or why it's not on the album. It doesn't really fit and all that. This song I'm a little more perplexed by. I think it would have fit on the album just fine. It may have been a strategic idea. And I know that a lot of bands, uh, at least I, I shouldn't say the bands, I should say record companies, because they're most likely the ones behind it. But they would have 
songs that the band recorded that were not included on the album, and they would only appear as B-sides on singles of hit songs. And, um, you know, I'm sure that there's certain uh, completists and things, uh, you know, very much like the way I'm doing the show. I want to get every uh, studio recorded track that I can. And um, but there's a lot of com- completists out there. And I'm sure that the record company saw that coming, you know, even in the, the early 70s, that that was going to be a thing if it wasn't already. But in any case, uh, I think it was a B-side to something. I just can't recall what. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a great song. So I don't really know why other than that, it wouldn't have been included on the album because there it's it's a finished track. It had all the treatment of everything else on the album. It doesn't sound out of context at all, like some of the others that we've heard. Um, like Home Again to You is mixed completely differently than the rest of the album, whereas this probably it was intended to be on the album. And then at the last minute, the record company said, no, we're going to we're going to hold that back and put that as a B-side on the single. But it's a great song. And you're going to hear that tomorrow. Now, just to prove I'm not senile. Well, not right now, anyway. Um, I will say that there are some people that are very important to this show that I want to take a moment and give a shout out to. Um, first of all, you know, I talk about Ace all the time. Uh, he's the the manager for your eye. He, he has just been so incredibly helpful. Whenever I have a question, he's, he's always very polite and responds to me, even if it's a ridiculous question. Um, he's been very kind. He's a really good guy. I could see why Mick picked him to be uh, you know, the the manager of the band and, and all that. He also manages Thin Lizzy and a bunch of other bands. Um, guy's busy, man. He's He's got his work cut out for him, especially right now where, uh, you know, everything's on this crazy hiatus. And like everyone else, he's got to figure out what to do. And he started a podcast called Ace on Music. I've got the links in the show notes. It's fantastic. You can listen on Stitcher. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, really cool. But he's a really nice guy. And I, I greatly appreciate all the uh, the help that he's given me along the way. So I want to take a minute and, and give a shout out to him. Uh, also, don't forget that the contest uh, will be drawn at the end of this month. And that is going to be drawn from the mailing list in the Patreon account. So if you are a Patreon, you get two. If you're a Patreon, no, if you're a patron, you get automatic double point entry into the show. There are certain tiers that are in the upper level tiers that give you additional entries. But I think everyone that's in there right now is in the additional, just one additional entry category. And um, so you'll get two entries. Everyone who has joined the mailing list, which I will uh, tell you right now, is at UriahHeapPodcast at gmail.com. If you are on that mailing list, the link is on the website uh, where you can just sign up. It's at the bottom of the page. Then you will get an automatic entry into the contest. Those are the ways that you can win fabulous prizes um, or prizes. Depends. <laughs> it depends on what you like, I guess. Um, so that's very important. Now, we have some wonderful people to thank our current patrons, thank you guys very much for for your donations to the show. It really does mean a lot. Um, I, I can't express the uh, the gratitude I feel because for one, it says that what I'm providing is really uh, you know it's enjoyable. People are liking it to the point that they're willing to you know say, "Hey, I enjoyed this so much. I want to throw a few bucks your way to help you with the cost of the show." I and mean, that's a huge compliment. That says a lot to me. And uh, just like anybody that has done ratings or reviews, I really appreciate anybody that's taken the time uh, now in this case, as well as the financial um, encumbrance, if you would, to help with the show's costs. Uh, It it really does mean a lot. And these wonderful people are at the $5 tier. Kenny Wymore. Thank you, Kenny. At the $3 tier, we have Peter Voss. Thank you, Peter. Goran Erickson. Thank you, Goran. And Frank Thielgard Mortensen. Thank you, Frank. And of course... At the $1 tier, the strongly sealed airtight gravesite. Thank you, airtight. Uh, your contribution is awesome. Thank you very much. Um, also, guys, remember to go on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and do a, uh, a, a star rating or review of the show, if you would. Uh, helps out greatly. 17 people have rated the show. Nine people have left reviews. Thank you guys very much. I know there's a ton of people that listen to the show. If uh, if you're happy with the show, if you enjoy it, there's a good chance somebody else will be and they may not have found the show. That will help them as well as all the people who have shared and, uh, you know, the word of mouth and all that also makes a very big difference. Another person who's made a big difference in the show is my logo designer, my graphic artist friend, Scott Lazinski, who has a great project coming up that I will talk about when it comes up, but it will be soon. 
And of course, my friends at Audionamics, without whom I will not do a podcast. Their product, Instant Dialogue Cleaner, also known as IDC, has made my podcasting life so much better. So thank you guys very much. And also, huge shout out to Dave White, the band's director of social media. He handles the website. He does all the posting. He always shares uh, episodes of this show out with the uh, you know, with the uh, Twitterverse and then on, um, on Facebook with the group there as well. Uriah Heap has a huge following on both of those pages. So it's very much appreciated. I think Instagram too. And uh, let's see, who else? Who else am I thinking of? Oh, yeah, my brothers at the Deep Dive Podcast Network. Of course, we've got Nate and John at the Deep Purple Podcast, my friends who brought me into this cult and changed my life forever. The Simple Man at Skinnered Reconsidered, Terry T-Bone Mathley at T-Bone's Prime Cuts. And if you guys didn't listen to Friday's show that I did with Terry when we reviewed Circus, go listen to Friday's show that I did with Terry when we reviewed Circus, because it was a fantastic episode. His show is fantastic. I love it. He's such a great interviewer. Uh, The time just flies on that show, hopefully like it does here. Maybe not. I don't know. Up to you. Uh, Rye at Sabbath Bloody Podcast and Paul, Joe, and David at the Lap of the Pods. All fantastic podcasts. Um, I'm well behind on uh, episodes, but I do enjoy all of those shows. And then check out gottahearemall.com where you can get information on Rainbow, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer slash Emerson, Lake, and Powell, their concert history and all kinds of cool, interesting tidbits. Uh, All wonderful stuff. Thank you, Allegra, for bringing that site to us. It's absolutely fantastic. You guys can follow the show at the website, scotthaskin.com, and then click on your Rye Heat podcast. I say it that way so that you have less to type in, or you could just click the link in the show notes. That's probably the easiest way to do it. That's what I would do. You can also click the link for Facebook and follow the Facebook feed there. Same at Twitter at Heap Podcast and Instagram at Uriah Heap Podcast. And for those of you who have now found your pencils, you can go to that site or the uh, the website, scotthaskin.com, your I Heat podcast, scroll all the way to the bottom and click on that email link for your entry into the drawing. Or you can uh, just go to gmail.com. Well, no, you probably can't do that. Just go there and sign up for it. Or if you want to write me, it is your I Heat podcast at gmail.com. That's it, guys. Thank you very much for joining me for another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's podcast, doing things a little bit backwards because you know what? Sometimes you got to switch it up a little bit. We'll be back tomorrow with the last song from Sweet Freedom, Sunshine. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days.